All right. Hi. So we're live now. Um, so today, thank you very much for joining the CoMentor Python Office Hours today. We're super excited to have the top answer of Python on Stack Overflow Martin with us today. So Martin is going to talk about um, um, Python internals and more. So let's. So Martin is going to start a 30-minute um, session. Uh, and then we can do an open Q&A. OK. Uh, let me quickly load my slides here. So I have my notes, and you can see what I'm talking about. And well, hi, everybody. And just, my name is uh, Martijn Peters. Don't worry about pronunciation. And I'm going to talk a bit about what goes on in the Python interpreter. Uh, but the optimizations that Python developers have made and how this may affect your own Python code. Uh, my goal here is, is to help Python developers avoid common pitfalls and write better code and faster code, not to explain in depth how this, the Python interpreter works. That may have been uh, uh, a misunderstanding, perhaps. Um, and my next key would be this. The tool is not working. There. Um, so, it, Python programming, like all programming, is all about abstractions. Uh, as Joe Spolsky's loves leak abstractions tells us, all non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. He was making a joke, but he does have a point. Uh, the Python interpreter is one big abstraction. It, it abstracts away how your Python code is translated to machine instructions. Uh, the reference implementation of the language, we often name it uh, C Python, is written in C, as the name implies. It, it's very much a non-trivial big program, and the abstraction is indeed leaky. I'm going to go explore some choices that the Python core developers have made that uh, can leak through into your own Python code and can lead to surprises, or you can make use of them. Uh, so first of all, everything in Python is an object. This includes your, your numbers, it includes your strings, it includes your functions, it includes your classes. Uh, integers are, are part of that too. Uh, if you're coming from C or from another language, uh, integers are often just numbers in memory. In Python, they're full-blown objects. But Python uses integers everywhere. If you ask for the length of an object uh, or you want to index into a, a list, or you want to index into a string, or slice a string. Everything you use, uh, use integers for that. And they are all objects. And Python has to create such objects. Every time you want to use the number 5, Python will go around and create the object. Um, to save creating and destroying a whole lot of objects during the lifetime of a Python program, the most commonly used integer values are cached. So every time you ask for the number 5, what really happens is that Python says, oh, I already have that object here. Use this same object number 5. And it happens for all integers from minus 5 all the way to 256. So all the numbers between those two endpoints are given you singletons. They're always the same single object. So you have one copy of the 5 object, one copy of the 6 object, etc. And that's fine, because integers are immutable. You cannot change the, no the value of number 5. You can change uh, a variable that points to an integer to point to a different integer. So if you say 5 plus 6, the number 11 is created, the integer 11 is created and stored into your variable instead. So, but the original numbers 5 and 6 didn't change. So Python makes it easy for you to, to save creating number 11 and creating number 5 and creating number 6 by always using the same cached copies. That can uh, create some problems. Why does this matter that, that Python does this? Well, Python has two comparison operators. One is called is, which tests for identity, and the other tests for equality with a double equal sign. And Python beginners can 
get confused between the two. They think maybe that they're the same or forget which one is which and use the wrong one. Because what is does is it tests if you have two references to two objects, like you call them foo and you call them bar, you can verify that they point to the same object. They can both be a reference to the same memory address, the same object that lives there, and then is is true. That is great for when you have the same object, but is not what you want when you want to test for the other thing, namely equality. Equality means the objects may or may not be the same thing, but they hold the same value, they represent the same thing. What happens then is that if you take the integers that have all been interned, and you think that is means equality, and the test comes true. If, if you have, I'm going to make a, a quick demo here. Um, switch over to the terminal. Let me switch off my hiding tool there. Say you create one number, and you create another number. Uh, the quick ones among us will see that these both are 42, so foo equals bar A. I made a typo. Try this again. They were not the same thing, now they are the same thing. Foo and bar are both 42, my favorite number. But surprisingly, this is true too. Because Python has given me the exact same object. We can use a function called id that shows uh, the current memory address of an object in CPython. That's the unique identifier, is, is the current memory address. And foo and bar have exactly the same address because they are, in fact, one and the same object. We have two pointers pointing to the same object. So a, a beginning Python programmer will not notice that they've made a mistake. Maybe they asked for input from a user. Maybe ask for uh, pick and you give them okay, so I'll take four. And they turn that into an integer and a test if that maybe is three. Of course it's false. This is certainly true. So the expectation is, is that, that uh, from the Python beginner is that is is the same thing as equals. Of course, this is not true because as soon as you come to larger numbers, and thousands, it becomes false while the value is true. Of course, for the 10,000 number, no uh, single copy exists. This is... Uh, extremely extremely confusing for some new beginners and something you really want to be aware of. Uh, a similar thing happens with strings. The, the Python um, interpreter works a lot with strings. The Just like small integers are reused by the constructor, uh, strings can also be reused, but Python uses a slightly different technique, it's called interning. Where integers are, small integers are always cached, you ask for five, you always get the same object. If you create new strings, the, 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 the Python interpreter can choose to create a cached copy of this. It will not always do this, but in certain circumstances, it will create an interned cached copy. And it does this for all your identifiers in your program. So if you write a piece of program that says uh, it creates a dictionary, or it creates a class and a method and local names in those in, in the functions. Those are all identifiers. Everything you assign to or any attribute in object are all identifiers, and they follow a pattern. They always have to start with a letter or an underscore, and they can contain only underscores, letters, and numbers. And those strings the Python interpreter interns. Because 
the, everything in Python, most things in Python are dictionaries. So you have a, a class object has a dictionary that defines what attributes it has. If you create an instance of that, the instance attributes are again stored in a dictionary. Your global namespace in the module is a dictionary. So Python has to do lots and lots of lookups of identifiers all over the place. If, if you use any name in your program, that's a lookup usually in a mapping, in a dictionary. By interning these, Python can make the lookup a lot faster. Because in dictionaries, objects are stored in a table that is a lot smaller than uh, all possible values. So if you put a string in there, it creates a, what Python does is it creates a hash from the object, from the string object, to create pick a slot in the table and compares future lookups or other objects that you try to put in the dictionary by first limiting the number of choices to look at with the hash. And then when it, once it picked out the hash table slot for that key, it has to compare the two values. So it will have to do a string comparison. Again, it uses is equals equals, but for string comparisons, that can be slow. If you have a string, if you do 100,000 string comparisons per second in a program, and you have to constantly compare all the characters in that program that it's going to be slower. But if you actually have interned things, then you can do a different trick. Python will first check if it is the same object. It does an identity test and see that this is even faster. All you have to do is compare the pointers. So if you use the name foo and in your program, it will look this up in the global namespace. It very quickly finds that the object is indeed in there, in the dictionary, because the C pointer comparison is so fast. This can, of course, then lead to the same kind of confusion uh, as with integers. Uh, I skip this then. You can make use of the of the same trick if you have to do your own string lookups a lot. So if you work with um, a large text pro processing program and you need to do a lot of replacements or lookups or respond to a lot of network messages with mappings, it could be advantageous to you to also use interning. If you read uh, strings from a file or strings from, an in from a network connection, these strings are not interned, uh, even though uh, you're uh, string literals may have been. You can then use a, the, the function intern to create your own copy of your own interned copy of such strings. So you receive data from the network, you call intern on it, then you know that you have a singleton copy of that string. And lookups in a dictionary against that string will be a lot faster. This, uh, you always may, may want to test this for, test, uh, for speed tests, but uh, it can be. Uh, make a huge difference, especially if these strings are a little larger. Uh, another optimization that uh, Python likes to make is uh, happens much earlier than during runtime. When during, this happens during compilation, if your Python code is compiled. Uh, several optimizations apply. Uh, not on this slide, but what I what did, does happen, and what I forgot to tell you about on a previous slide, is that when you create string literals that are part of your code, they are also interned, provided that they look like identifiers. If you have a string that consists just of, of numbers and letters and underscores, Python assumes it probably is being used as an identifier, so let's intern this and store this with your code. Your the Python, the Python people optimizer does a few more tricks at this time as well. When you compile Python code, that maybe looks a little bit of this. I'm going to create a quick example. Let's say we have a, a simple function.
in this code I've used two literals, uh, a string literal and an integer literal. And to save you the having to create these objects each time you load your Python code, Python instead stores them as literals. Uh, in the foo object now, there's a code object assigned with this. I should use the right terms. And there is a set of constants associated with this. So we see that none, which is an often used object, hello world, uh, space, which is also used in the code, and the number 20 are all stored as, uh, as constants. Python does this for you, but it does more than that too. Uh, back to my slides. It, uh, apart from storing the constants, it will also do a few more tricks for you. It will uh, simplify several types of expressions, and it will replace certain types of mutable objects with immutables. I'll get to that in a second. The uh, expressions that are simplified, I'm going to enlarge something here. The expressions that are simplified are uh, any calculation that you find in your code. So say that you want to store the value for, for a, a duration. Uh, you can simply store that in your function as a, uh, a calculation. And Python will not have to rerun that calculation each time because what, it, what the peephole optimizer does is actually store the result of your expression. This happens for sequences as well. Uh, so anything that is immutable and has an expression is actually pre-calculated at compile time and stored. So the uh, this, this happens for any type of sequence, including strings. So if you have a string that consists of multiple uh, pieces and you actually put them together with plus, they will actually be uh, replaced by the final result. Uh, might make that a little clearer. So again, if I make a function, store some of these. They look like something you don't want to do in a function that is going to be called a lot of times. Because you, who wants to do this this calculation every time you call a function when it's just really a constant? And I'm going to um, add a different one that will not be optimized to show you the limits of this. Because another thing you might uh, do is make something really big. Now, the first two, duration and Nina, will have now been expanded into the result of the expression, while the big constant is not. Uh, you can see that when we actually look at the code object that's being produced. And the type. And here we see all the original constants used for the expression. We have uh, 10, 24, and 60 in Nina, as well as many other of the numbers used. But we also see the results of the expressions being in interpolated. So 2 into 40 is 10 times 24, and then we uh, times 60 and times 60 again are all included. And Python will now actually load the 8, 86,000, uh, 80, 864,000. Uh, number every time you refer to duration. The same goes for Nina. It refers to the longer string Nina, Nina, Nina. But surprisingly, the one, two, three tuple has not been expanded. That's because the people optimizer is also being smart about space. A uh, tuple of 3,000 elements will make your code uh, files, your, your bytecode files, 
unusually large, and therefore it limits such expressions to of, uh, where a um, sequence is multiplied to at most 20 times. Anything longer than 20 is going to be ignored. This means also that for some strings, there's limits to this because a string easily gets more than 20 characters. This is a short string. It's slightly longer. In this case, just the quarter string has been turned into a constant, while the quick brown fox terms over the lazy fox has been left as two separate constants and has not been concatenated for you. You generally make use of this to not worry about all the constants that you might use. Um, I also talked about how mute immutables may actually be, be used instead of, immut uh, instead of mutables. Anywhere you find a membership test, so you use in to test against a string uh, literal, like in this slide I used a set literal to test if a value falls within one, in one of three values. The set that is created with this literal is really a mutable object just like a list object, you could change this in, in principle. But Python recognizes that in this case we're talking about a constant. Because you uh, don't assign this uh, set to anything, nothing will ever be able to reach into your code and change and add, for example, MultiPython to that, that, that uh, set. And it therefore knows that it can replace the set with a frozen set in your constants and store that with you with your code. What this means is that you can make you should you can and should make use of uh, sets whenever you need to test for a membership. If you have a value that you need to validate, it always is going to be part of a limited set of values. Use a set there to test against because uh, a set membership test is uh, in big O notation in uh, is a constant cost operation, it will always take the same amount of time, however large the set is, and will always therefore be faster than testing against a tuple or a list. Python does the same thing with lists. If you put a list in a membership test like this, a literal object, and you test against that, then Python will replace that in the code with an actual tuple constant. Again, I'm going to quickly switch over to my terminal. And I wish that Google Hangouts had actually published keyboard shortcuts for this, so I could do this much quicker. So if you use a uh, containment test, with a set, or with a list, And once again, Python has now made some changes to the code and has stored a frozen set and a tuple as constants. And to show you what, uh, what happens with these things, with these constants, I'm going to introduce you to a new little tool of mine uh, that is always very helpful when you look at uh, code optimization and exactly what Python does is the disassembly tool. The disassembly module gives you the original, uh, the, the bytecode of an actual uh, piece of code and you can pass in a function to see what the associated code object looks like. And Python then gives you the original, the bytecode that it actually executes. So for the 
first if test it has to load a global namely foo because I didn't pass this in as an argument so it has to be a global and it loads my constant the frozen set and does a comparison against this and for the same test against uh, the list we see that a constant is loaded it loads the tuple a very simple uh, load from an array which is very fast does this comparison and test again uh, again I can't reiterate how, how uh, important it is that if you do this you use a, a literal if you do something different and you store this set or a list in a separate object this optimization doesn't take place if you uh, use your code like this and create an allowed set Have a look at the disassembly for that. Suddenly, the code is not longer loading one constant object, it has to load three constant objects, foo, bar, and baas. It will have to build a set from that. It stores that into a variable, and only then can it do the, in the, the containment test. So it actually has to do a four, five extra operations here to load the constants and create a whole new object, which is a relatively expensive operation before it can do your in-test. In such cases, at the very least, use a frozen set, so that Python can store the frozen set as a, as a constant, uh, um, which also doesn't happen, actually. Uh, constants can only be literals, and a frozen set is not a literal, so it cannot be stored as a constant. But the, uh, th this does apply to list versus tuples, uh, a tuple can be created with a, a literal syntax with the, the parentheses and therefore will be stored as a single constant object. Uh, we did go there. I switch back here and switch. Um, I'm otherwise would love to talk a bit more about various other optimizations in the uh, the Python interpreter, but I uh, also had heard a few questions in the audience, so I'm going to switch to uh, the questions. All right, guys, any questions? Do we do we have to ask questions about optimization? You can also ask about uh, about Python, general Python questions. That's fine too. Okay, so I have one. I'm just sort of learning um, object-oriented programming mm -hmm. with Python, and yeah. one thing that one thing that I'm struggling to understand is composition. I think I understand inheritance. I don't think I understand composition as well in terms of just OOD and Opti I guess that sort of gets to optimization with name conflicts, but could you describe what you, like your, could you describe composition for me and like how you use it? A composition is anything that, uh, any containment relationship, so anything you put inside of something else is a containment. Th th that's quite orthogonal to uh, inheritance where you create a hierarchy of objects that define behavior. Uh, so inheritance is a vehicle which can be subclassed, be, be subclassed into say a car or a truck or a bike or a plane. While you never will subclass a vehicle into a person, but a vehicle can contain people. So containment is, is a very different relationship than inheritance. You would never. Uh, you would certainly. Uh, uh, you, you could. You could change what a class contains. A vehicle, like a bike, can usually only contain one pe one person. Uh, I am Dutch. I have had people on the back uh, of my bike and on the front of the bike, but the limit really is three people. While a car can maybe hold six, and a bus can hold twenty. So, 
there is a relationship perhaps between inheritance and containment in that way, but they are quite different con uh, concepts otherwise. Okay, th thank you. Any more? Uh, yes, I have one question, if I may. Uh, I have a question about optimization. Uh, is uh, it performed only on constant, only on constants, on strings, uh, or can also be performed on some objects, classes? Um, you mean uh, storing as constants, or uh, do you mean uh, reusing of uh, singletons? I'm not entirely certain what you mean here. Note that, uh, note that the optimization can only t store immutable objects, and where Python is confident about it, they are immutable at compile time. Uh, so, for example, if I have a set of uh, my own classes that I don't assign a variable to, uh, will this optimization work in the latest case? So, you have a set literal that refers to several objects that you have uh, create as, as literal calls in there. So let's say a set of your class A, your class B, your class C as uh, arguments, you mean? Python cannot optimize that because it doesn't know until you run the program what your class names refer to. The class names themselves are dynamic, so the code could, in principle, swap out those names to mean something else. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, I might have one more question. Certainly. Uh, I have a question about uh, mixins. Uh, uh, is it a preferable way to use them in Python? Or maybe it's better to use, uh, to, uh, to include this instance, for example, of other classes inside new class, not to create this multiple inheritance? Uh, uh, or is it, is it some legacy from other languages? Or is it uh, a necessary or useful feature of the language? I think it's an extremely useful feature of the language to, to be able to uh, create an additional class that defines a different aspect that doesn't fit in your, the rest of your structure. So to give a bit of extra functionality to a set of classes that they are also this. So you have vehicles that maybe are also um, emergency vehicles. So you can have a truck that is also an emergency vehicle and therefore needs a siren. But not all trucks are emergency vehicles. And maybe other types of vehicles may also be emergency vehicles. You have motorcycles that are part of the police force and haven't helped us even the police use bikes these days. And they may also, be, may also, who knows, be emergency vehicles and therefore need that extra functionality. But not all bikes are emergency vehicles. And I think that Mixing classes can really help with that kind of thing. No, thank you. I have one more, uh, sort of just general again because I'm a beginner. Um, I r currently use Python 2.7, and aside from the nightmarish encoding issues, I think it it it's I haven't found like major issues. I noticed that you use Python 3.4. Is there something, or at least on that machine, is there some like specific reason you give to those of us who are learning Python to move up to into Python 3, 3.3, 3 or 3.4? Uh, until Python 3.3 3 and 3.4 have come out, I would certainly have told you to go stick with Python 2.7. Um, but Python 3.4... There are some very nice new additions to the library that, that also make it life easier for beginners. Uh, there finally is a, a object-oriented path library, for example. Um, the enumeration edition is also very nice. It, it it's kind of depends on what third-party libraries you need to depend on. Um, in Python 2, you can quite easily be Unicode aware and do the right thing and avoid the uh, implicit encoding 
decoding issues that you might have when you mix byte strings and Unicode strings. Um, but Python 3 is where the new action is. Python 3.3 and 3.4 are getting all the, the cool new features, the cool new libraries now. Uh, developers really have nailed the, the three line now. It's, it's performant, it's working really well. So they can now focus on moving the, the ecosystem forward again and, and creating cool new additions to the language. And that's all going to happen in the, the, three, the, the, the three point X line now. Python 2.7 is definitely the end of the line for the 2.x series. That said, it's not that hard to switch over to Python 3. Uh, the, the reason I just used Python 3.4 for my demo is because it has uh, some nice uh, auto-completion features in there that I may want to have, have used. Uh, the interpreter has a, uses uh, tab completion and uh, history better than previous releases did. Okay, but and so otherwise, between three three and three four, it just depends on the libraries, the third party yeah. libraries used. Yeah, between between two and three. Okay. So for a long time, if you were doing web development, for example, uh, for a long time, loads and loads of libraries that you might rely on were two point x only. They were not yet ported to Python three, and therefore your Porting was harder. Working in Python 3, you would actually miss some of the ecosystem that makes Python so great. Okay, thank you. I, think, I, I believe that someone had sent in a, a question beforehand. Um, yeah, sorry, let's check again. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mike, I have one, one last question. Uh, it's sort of like a general question about uh, where Python goes, for example. Uh, what do you think? Where is uh, where is its future? What, what are his major uh, major breaks are going to be? For example, in web development or some system tools. So where where is it heading now? Oh. Uh, for uh, to have a crystal ball to see the future, um, I'm a web developer myself, so I, I that's that's a large focus of what I do, um, and it always has been strong in that. Uh, I started with Zope in 1998. Uh, it was a pioneer in its days, and Python is still pioneering a lot of things in in web development today. Uh, but in the meantime, the, the scientific community really has taken off, taken Python to its heart. We've gotten uh, SciPy and NumPy and Pandas, some fantastic tools that make it, that make use of the uh, the ease of use of the Python language and its uh, dynamic nature to explore data sets and to to do some great science. Um, and recently. In universities, uh, it, Python has overtaken Java now as the number one learning language. So we'll see a lot more from Python in the future, uh, as long as, as as it finds it will find new places where it plays to its strength, where, where the, uh, the the rep, the ability to rapidly write uh, extremely readable code and uh, to to be able to rapidly evolve the code uh, is is an advantage. Um, Sure, there are more areas uh, in development that, that I can't foresee that Python will also take off in. Yeah, thank you. Keep them coming. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the the question I I uh, was sent to us beforehand. I'm going to read this out for a second. I'd love to hear more about uh, CPython internals in particular. Uh, I'm interested in asking about the decision to use... Uh, unfortunately, my sidebar here is a little smaller and it's cut off the text, so I'm going to have to grab my email client and just read it in there. Um, yes, I'd love to hear more about CPython internals, uh, wrote someone on Twitter uh, or an email. In particular, I'm interested in asking about the decision to use a stack rather than register-based interpreter 
and if the core team ever discusses moving to a register-based interpreter to use of Python, uh, to use in Python on resource-constrained devices like smartphones, to make that more feasible. Um, first of all, I'm not actually part of the the, the, the core uh, team of developers on Python, uh, so I do not know everything that the, the core team is thinking about. I do know that at Google there was a project called Unladen Swallow, which was an attempt to see if the Python interpreter could be reworked to be faster and uh, perhaps JIT, uh, uh, so just-in-time compilation was maybe uh, inter integratable into the core. Uh, and they certainly did talk about use, switching from a stack to a register-based interpreter. Just, uh, perhaps I need to give a little background as to what that means. Um, Python bytecode currently uses a stack, which means that uh, it uses a, a a piece of memory where uh, recent values are pushed onto the stack and bytecode takes off the top one or two values and uh, replaces the top of the stack with the results of expression. So if you add one plus two, one goes on the stack, two goes on the stack, and then the, the bytecode uh, for addition takes those two values from the stack, adds them up and push, pushes back three onto the stack and then the next bytecode may store it into a variable for example or uh, send it to a function. A register-based interpreter, on the other hand, uses a limited number of registers, just like a hardware CPU does, and stores the values in there. So instead of getting things from a stack, you then have to address in your bytecode those registers. And the advantages are that you can reuse register values. Uh, I also believe that just-in-time compilers are can make use of the registers more efficiently than make use of a stack. And a stack, not having a stack, which can be a bit larger, you can control memory use more for constrained devices. Um, a stack is easier to code, though, uh, to, to use, though. And I'm not entirely aware what Guido's thinking was, is to use a stack, or maybe he hasn't, hasn't ever considered using a register. Uh, but that's what CPython uses now. And the unfortunately, the unladen swallow project is uh, was discontinued, but a lot of its ideas did go into the PyPy implementation, where I do believe they have been uh, experimenting with that kind of registry. But I'm not 100% certain what happened there. So yes, it has been thought about, it has been discussed, but to overhaul the Python interpreter now to move to a completely different model is uh, out, not currently in scope. Any more questions? Um, any other questions, guys? Um, maybe could you recommend some libraries to look at? Maybe they're not very popular, but uh, you find them handy to use in your everyday use for web development and just for everyday tasks. Um, well, I recently have learned, that I'm a huge fan of the request library. So if you ever do anything with uh, HTTP requests to other servers, go straight past the URL lib that comes with Python and install requests. It's a fantastic tool. It, it really has a much more intuitive API and makes using uh, web requests much easier. That is often, if you're web scraping, if you're looking at web pages and extract information, used with a tool called Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup is a, is a great uh, HTML parsing library that makes sense of the soup that is HTML. I recently came across a new library that marries the two. Um, it's called uh, Robo Browser, and it is based on these two tools to replace an older tool called Mechanize that does similar things, namely let you uh, simulate a browser that goes out to the web, fetches HTML pages, lets you fill in forms and submit those. So if you have to crawl a web page that requires forms or following links to just so that you can get to the data that you want to get to and extract the data, take a look at Robo Browser. It's a 
relatively young project still, uh, but I like the way the, the API works and the tools it uses and how it works. It's, uh, it's definitely something you should look at. Um, the or maybe on the server side, I recently was something piqued my interest called Autobahn that is uh, doing for web sockets. It makes programming web sockets easy. That's for me as a web developer always interesting. And it makes actually makes use of the, the new async IO library in Python 3.4. If you can use that. Uh, daily development tools. Um, something I rely on is Flake 8, which is a linter. It combines PEP8, so the, the Python style guide testing, together with uh, PyFlakes, which detects uh, common errors in your code and tells you that you, things like um, imports that you forgot to add or imports that you have too many and other such, uh, such niceties. So it helps keep your code, uh, writing code much easier. It integrates very nicely with, uh, with modern in, uh, IDEs I use uh, Sublime Text, and uh, I have a plugin that, that puts uh, Flake 8 error messages right at my fingertips whenever I save a file. That's not a new project, but it is certainly one I use every day. I I have a quick question on on um, scraping frameworks. Do you use Scrapey, or do you have do you just do raw with your beautiful soup or Robo Browser? I, I I haven't actually come across a project where I would use Scrapey. Uh, Scrapey is very good at extracting patterns of, of specific data. So let's say you want to uh, scrape the latest football scores from the major leagues in Britain. And in this case, I don't, I don't do, ever do this. I'm not really a sports guy myself, but I can imagine that some people do. So you have to go across multiple pages, perhaps multiple websites, and extract the same information. Uh, Scrapey is great for that. It can automate searching and um, uh, walking through a site and extracting very structured data that you can uh, specify with XPath expressions. I'd, I'd love to actually have a project to do that, but I haven't had a chance yet. I've, I've been advising people about it, but not actually have been uh, using it in anger. Thank you. Um, sorry, so speaking of the um, scraping, how what what's your take about like some of the reason companies say a reason why C company called Kimono Labs? Have you heard of that? Uh, sorry, Kimono Labs. Yes, I, I've not heard of that. I'd love to look it up, but. Right, they they provide a, a scraping service to. Turn it into an API. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can imagine that they they use tools like uh, like requests and, and beautiful soup for that kind of thing. That's that's what I would look at certainly. Uh, perhaps Scrapey as well. Mm -hmm. um, what's your question exactly about uh, about Kimono Labs? I'm, I'm not sure I caught you there. Um. Would you see this as a potential replacement for all the um, scraping frameworks out there? I, I would have to quickly have a quick look at what they're doing because they automate creating. Okay, so they they, they automate wrapping a site into an API. Uh, you still would need to call the the Kimono Labs API, so you still would be using your own tools, but it would make things a bit easier. Right. But I'd worry a little about latency, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who wants maybe a bit more control over this myself. I would have to look a little bit more about your API. I don't, I don't know yet what, how, what they do. OK, thank you. I have. Um one more if we're close to out of time and no one else has a question about um, Martine and Stack Overflow. I mm -hmm. think maybe I've made like one downvote in my entire life. Like I said, I'm new to programming and I happen to downvote the master. 
uh, Martin himself, the first person to ever answer a question for me on there. Um, and it was about it was if on. I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> it was it was Meta Stack Exchange, so it was more like okay. a, an opinion. And there was a guy asked about um, a following feature, like adding a sort of following feature. And you seem to have very strong a very strong opinion against that feature. And the argument I would make for it, and one of your points was, this is not a social network. Don't try to make it a social network. And you know, I'm obviously I'm very sympathetic to that, but what what I would argue for is the you guys, the experts in these languages, are very much uh, are are much clearer than the documentation. So from a beginner, I would literally follow you know you and some of these other guys with these trillions of points on there, and and just if I could just you know, scroll through it and read the answers, I get more out of it. Does that make does that make sense what yeah. and I think that's what the guy was asking for. What are your thoughts on that and why do you feel so opposed to it? There there is the danger that that we start to focus too much on a, a subset of experts. I was once new. Um, I, my account says that I've been there for five years, but in the very beginning, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything until about two, two and a half years ago. Before that, I all I did was answer a, a couple of plum questions here and there. So I'm relatively new to this scene. Uh, so I've not been around as long as John Skeet. So I, as an upcoming and new common guy, I wouldn't want have to be, want to have to bud my way in into the established networks of what you follow. Um, that said, you can get an RSS feed of all John Skeet's question, uh, answers, uh, or from from me, or from any of the other top scoring guys. So you can put me in your RSS reader and and read all my posts if you wanted to. But to Stack Overflow really is all about the content itself, the 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 questions and the answers and and. I'd rather see a feed of what really happens with hot questions and, and highly voted posts that you that you look at those because I'm not the only guy out there writing Python answers that are good. Right. Okay. And what? How do you do the RSS feed? This is just it's not something that Stack Overflow offers. They just offer an API where you can get there's, your there's, RSS. There, there is there, there is a, a an icon on every user page. So if you scroll down the bottom right hand side. There is a uh, an icon. Let me see if I go to. I can show it to you real quick. Mm. Let's do this, do this in a way that I'm not going to expose stuff. Let me get a screen share. I'm going to go real briefly. Recursive. So here we have John Skeet, and if you scroll down, in the bottom right hand side here is a little thing called the user feed. An RSS icon. Click on that and add that to your RSS feeder. And you should be able to uh, follow John Skeet. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. This also have. You can also do this with questions, and you can do this with any tag as well. There's always this little icon there. It's not just Thanks. users. And yes, I consider Stack Overflow related stuff on topic for today's talk as well. All right, everyone. Do you have any other questions for Mark? Um, yes, one more from me. Sure. Uh, could you recommend some maybe feeds, uh, authors uh, to read or to subscribe to, to, to learn Python from experts? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy. Um, I my feeds are mostly comics and Stack Overflow and uh, some non-programming related news sites. So um, that's a hard one. I, I'd go through Planet of Python and and look at the RSS archivator there. I would not know who to recommend to you. I'm sorry. I learned Python too long ago. 
No, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, time is almost up. Um, if anyone else has no other questions, let's call this a day. Sure. Well, it was my pleasure. Um, yeah, so people. thank you so much for your time, Martin. I appreciate sure. it. I hope people enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.